Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to our uh, Sierra Media channel on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, this is Al Fadi and we are going to uh, continue our discussion uh, with this brand new series on the supposed uh, scientific miracles of the Quran. Uh, the intent behind this series is to uh, analyze and critique these uh, scientific proofs that are presented to us by our Muslim friends and show that there is always a response to every single one of them. With me here, uh, my dear brother Jay Smith, who uh, gave an excellent introduction uh, in the last episode about uh, why this is important. And today he is going to continue with that introduction as well in terms of uh, uh, science uh, and Islam and Islamic scientists as well. So it's a background, basically, uh, uh, before we get into the actual items or issues that we will be addressing and critiquing. Well, yes, let's go ahead and do that. In the last, the first episode in the introduction, we asked the question, why do we even need to do this? And the reason is because the Muslims are doing it. The Muslims have to find, they're desperate, they have to find authority for this book, the Quran. Uh, they can't be, look at the inter internally. There are so many contradictions. We've come up with around 225 contradictions. Uh, they there are even two verses that uh, make way for our actually alleviate those contradictions. Chapter two, verse 106. Chapter 16, verse 101, uh, which are what we know as the law of abrogation. Mansuk and uh, Mansuk and uh, Nasik. Nasik and Mansuk. And yeah, that's yeah. abrogated you, and uh, and the abrogator. The abrogator and the abrogated. And the, right. the context there is that the later Nasik uh, de abrogates the the former. So right. in this case, Medinan would abrogate the Meccan. Meccan. That's correct. Now, can you then understand why they have to find some other place than to find authority for this? Well, they can't go to manuscript evidence. We pretty well did that just in our, oh, that series it's, that we just it's done. It's done, my friend. I mean, you, you can stick a fork in it. <laughs> you can stick a fork in it. The <laughs> manuscripts are all proving to be not only too late, uh, right. but they're not even complete, and they don't agree mm -hmm. with each other to, let's say, nothing of the fact they agree with this book. So where are you going to go to find authority? Well, that's why people like Yusuf Karadawi there in Al Jazeera Television has uh, day after day, night after night, where he tries to scour through this and find any scientific proofs. And you, you, uh, you will find many Western, especially those coming out of the Indian subcontinent, who are now making this an industry. Mm. Uh, and the debate we had a few weeks ago with Nadir Ahmed, he's made this, uh, that's been his signature piece for the last 11 years. So but he's he, almost like the equivalent to Ahmed Didat, basically, uh, on the other side. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. So if this were the case, then you can see why they, if they don't have anything else to give authority for this book, they're now going back to science to give authority for this book, suggesting that scientific proofs, obviously the, uh, the, the conclusion is this is from God because how could a man named Muhammad have known something this scientifically that in the seventh century? That same that same claim also destroys it because what right. all you need is one proof to show that it, that if uh, or one error to show that the God <laughs> is an error, therefore it cannot be from God. It must be from man, men who make errors. But the, the one thing they do come up with, and this is fascinating, they do come up with these these great scholars, and they come up with these great p pieces of science and mathematics that they claim are introduced by Muslims. Right. I remember a number of years ago, I was in London where I lived for 25 years and uh, the British Museum, no, I'm sorry, the, uh, not the British Museum, the Science Museum in London put a special wing and reserved it just for Islamic science. And it was really to placate the Muslims there and it was the, one, the Muslims who put this whole exhibition on. And we went to it and we spent about an uh, afternoon in it. And you had display after display, beautifully done. It must have been cost a mint to put all these together. All about rockets. The first rocket was invented by a Muslim. Mathematics was invented by Algebra a Muslim. Algebra and everything else. Algebra, you know? yeah. especially. The, they uh, talked about the first, uh, the first uh, university was a Muslim university. The whole way of the blood cycle was right. all invented by Muslims. And they're looking at these great Muslim scholars as the ones who created this. And I remember looking at that and I said, well, they're actually taking very little and expanding it to very much. They're making a mountain out of a molehill. But more than that, I was fascinated because even much of the material that they were assessing was Islamic was not Islamic at all. Many, much of it came from India. 
right. came from the lands that they had conquered. That's right. And, and even from Spain, uh, uh, from part of North Africa, I mean, all of these lands have already been developed before Islam showed up. Yeah. Uh, there's one that really tickled my uh, my bones, but tickled my fancy, and it was a claim that they were the ones, it was a Muslim who was the first to discover flight. And they had a picture of a tower, and they had a picture of a Muslim who had jumped off the tower with, with some his, wings exactly, and feathers on it. Exactly, yeah. And he had made it to the ground, and because he had made it to ground, he was the first man. Long before the Wright brothers had created airplanes, Muslims were the first to create airplanes. You can see, and I had to laugh after a while when we got through it, it became almost comical because it became more and more ridiculous. Pervis Hudboy, who is a Pakistani, he's a scientist himself, has written a whole book on this, and he is, he is just despairing uh, that there is even this science, this, I mean, there is this need to find this science within Islam. And he also acknowledges that the reason before this need is because they really don't have any other place to go to. But he did admit that there were some great, some great scientists in Islam, as you will find in any great history of any great people. There are many good scientists in Islam. We do know that. Let's just go to the slides and just look right. at a few of them right here. Uh, we, I, I don't think anybody, I, well, very few people would not know this man, Ibn, Ibn Sina. Sina. Yeah. He was a polymath. He was also a physician and a, an astronomer, very well known. No one would su to suggest that he wasn't uh, astute. Here's another one, uh, Omar Khayyam. Yeah, he was the one that gives a solution to cubic equation. Jabir Ibn, Jabir Ibn Hayyan, Hayyan uh, brilliant research in chemical apparatus. And so these are household names in the Islamic world. This man may not be a household name in the Western world, but the first two certainly were. Here's another one, Al-Jazari, credited with building many of the intricate machines. In fact, if you, he is considered to be the one that built the first clock. And if you look at the diagrams in the background, there is a diagram of one of the original clocks that he built. Uh, and, and fascinating. So you can see that these guys are well known in the Muslim world. They're becoming better known in the Western world. Here's Nasir al-Din al-Tusi. And he is one that's been credited with giving us trigonometry. Now, there's an awful lot of uh, debate whether or not he invented it or he was the first to create it because there is references of trigonometry that predate him from India. And a lot of this does come out of India, and you have to give credit to where credit is due. Uh, so you, these are famous uh, Muslim scientists. Here's the problem. In almost every case, these Muslim scientists, these scholars, Though they may have been deeply committed Muslims, we don't know, they practice science, and according to Pervez Hudboy, they practice science in an essentially secular kind. They never used any Quranic text to find their discoveries. They never credited the Quran for finding any of these discoveries. That's true. I mean, uh, uh, this movement about uh, scientific miracles of the Quran is, is something that did not happen early on. And the reason why is because their interest, according to Pervez, uh, was in discovering important physical laws and creating new concepts. They were interested in looking at the world around them. They were interested in how to work with what they had in their hands, looking and understanding how the world worked, and then trying to perfect it, create right. certainly uh, create types of mathematics that would help them understand how to uh, not only control their own lives, but also contraptions to make their lives easier, like making clocks and things like that. They never got any of this that we can see from any of the writings from any concept in the Quran. That's important. He goes on and says that to this day, Muslim clerics and scholars denounce them as heretics and believers. They were seen as heretics then. They're still seen as heretics today by many of your Muslim, uh, uh, certainly your clerics. Right. So these heroes of Muslim culture were most often threatened, according to... Uh, Pervez, not by infidel Christians nor Mongol hordes, but by the virulent anti-science of the Orthodox Muslim ulama. So this attitude that existed during their lifetime, continued even after their deaths, still continues even today in much of the si of the Muslim world. And I want to add, you know, one simple thing. You know, I grew up in Saudi, by the way, and one of the grand muftis in there, his name is Abdul Aziz ibn Baz. And he was asked a question, said that NASA discovered that the Earth is round 
when in fact the Quran says it's flat? The answer was, NASA is wrong, the Quran is right. <laughs> now you might say that he's just a quack and he's just somebody who is a notor 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 notorious in that, that country. And I would agree, there are many quacks in Christianity too. Um, there have been many quacks in America who still believe the earth is flat. In fact, there's a flat earth absolutely, society. Absolutely. And you can go on the internet and, and look down at, 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 at all their fi supposed findings and they dispel any notion that any rocket has been up in space. Sure. And, mm. uh, and all these pictures are nothing more than fabrications by NASA. So you can find out on both sides. What is fascinating to me is is that number one, none of these scientists that we named, the five that we named, not one of them ever pointed to the Quran to find his or uh, And that's his. important, by the way. That's extremely important. He was, they were not interested in trying to find this in the Quran. This is something that is now just coming out in our lifetime. It's coming out in well, my lifetime more so, in the 20th century, in the 21st it's century. It's progressive apologetics, typical of Islam. Now, look at the slide, and let's look at some of the books that are up there. I just decided I wanted to go up on Amazon.com and just look at the books that are there. You can see many of these books are actually well-known. 101 Inventions, that's a very popular book. Probably the one that's most famous and the one that maybe we should start out with is the one on the bottom right. Morris Bukai. I don't know if you can read the writing. The bottom right to the right. Uh, if you can, you actually uh, circle it there. Uh, okay, so you're talking about the one that says on science. the far right, the bottom, the so bottom line, that blue one. This one. Far yeah. right. Okay, got it. This if one you could right just here. circle that. Yeah. So that's the one that probably most Muslims yeah, start with. His name is right here. Morris, Morris Bukai. Bukai is a French scientist of sorts who converted to Islam and wrote the famous book. The Quran, the Bible, and science. That's right. And was refuted, of course, by uh, Dr. William, um, uh, I can't remember his last name now, in uh, answering Islam. He actually refuted, uh, refuted it pretty well. And if you look at his book, The Quran and the Bible in the Light of Science, just right. destroyed it. Yeah. And in fact, I, I would suggest people do read it. And I can't remember his last name either. Isn't that fascinating right yeah. now? Right. Nonetheless, we'll get back to it and we'll put it and we'll write it on the screen. Yeah. But uh, take a look at these books. 1, William Campbell. There you go. William Campbell. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. Uh, in fact, he, he has deceased now. His wife still lives in Pennsylvania, not too far from me. The Encyclopedia of the Golden Age of Science. You just take a look at these. Science Under Islam. And when you see the titles, you can see the perfect guide to the science of the Quran. These are almost superlative in their, in their claims. They're almost assuming that if you read this book, you will see that the Quran itself is almost, can be the foundation of everything we know about science. And they're almost making those claims, which is unfortunate. And that's why Pervez Hudboy decries what's going on. And he, he is absolutely angered by this need by Muslims to go back to that which is not there. Mm -hmm. right. Now, let's go on and let's ask, we asked why science, why do they need to do that? And we suggested that maybe the reason could be that they have nowhere else to go. This is probably desperation. Fascinating, if you have to look internally at the science in the Quran, then you're already, uh, you're already admitting that there is a problem with the Quran in every other area. That's right. And, and you know, you, you're trying desperately to find other things that has, haven't been tried before, by the way. I mean, it's like when we talk about the attacks against Christ, for instance, that started from day one. Attacks against his deity started from day one. Uh, claims that uh, contradict his teaching started from day one. So you'll find things like this happening from day one, but you don't find anything from day one about scientific miracles in the Quran. Don't you think uh, there's, uh, the, the Muslim society and early Muslim would have jumped all over this to prove the fact that their book and their man were true? Fascinating because I wanted to find out why exactly they spent so much time on science in the Quran. And I asked a number of Muslim friends when I was at Speaker's Corner, why is it this need to find scientific proofs? What's going on here? One of the fellows that came up to me, his name is Abdul, I remember him, and he said, you know, Mr. Smith, one of the difficulties we have as Muslims is that we all of us go home and we go back to Pakistan and we go back to Bangladesh and we go back to Morocco and when we go back to our homes, we notice that 
we're so far behind the West. We're so far behind in almost every category, socially, economically, and especially when it comes to science. When, when is the last time anybody invented something that we all use from the Muslim world? That's right. And, and you know, he has an excellent point, by the way, which I want to piggyback on what you just said earlier. If these Muslim scientists discover things, then how come we don't see a continuation of that? Well, these Muslim signs, as we said earlier, were not using the Quran. But I, I, I decided um, we did this at Speaker's Corner. We brought this up as a, as a problem. And what they said is there is a need by Muslims to, for an identity. And their identity That's is right. so wrapped up in one book and one man that they've got to, they ha, they, in order for their identity to remain intact, they've got to do what the West has done. They're on a defense all the time. And I wanted to say, okay, let me just ask you a question. I remember asking this at one of my times there. I said, take a look at the Muslim world, 1.8 billion. How many Nobel laureates have you won in science or physics That's right. or mathematics? I don't remember. Zero. Yeah. Now, let's look at the Jews who make up 12 million. Six wow. million in Israel, another six million in the United States. 12 million versus 1.8 billion. How many Jews have won Nobel laureates? I, if I want to take a shot yeah. at it, it's probably uh, half a do- I mean, more than a dozen or two, maybe? Try 300. Okay. 300 Nobel laureates have been won just by Jews, not just in Israel, but Jews all over the world. If that many Jews from just 12 million can win that many doctorates, I'm sorry, <laughs> Nobel laureates, that most all of them did have doctorates, then that suggests to me that Jews are able to do that which Muslims are not. And if so few people can win that many Nobel laureates, and yet so huge number of Muslims haven't even won one in this area, the Nobel laureates that they have won are usually in literature, and the Peace Prize, that's Yasser Arafat, of all people, winning the Peace Prize. Can you see then that there is a need by Muslims to create this type of identity since they can't go to their own men, except for ancient names, right. as you mentioned, who don't really use the Quran to, for, to find any of their, theirs is very secular. They then have to spend all their time going back to this book. And that, when I mentioned that I, I, at Speaker's Corner, they realize that there's a real problem here. And one of the things we want to do now is to go look at some of those proofs. Yes, and we will do that. Uh, so... Uh... How about we start maybe... Uh, I think the next episode, probably the best one to get into that, because it's obvious to me that we need to unpack each one of them. Absolutely, but uh, I wanted to, uh, if you can give an idea of what that would be, so that our audience will be prepared uh, to engage with us. We're going to look at mountains as tent pegs. We're going to look at the embryological cycle. Uh, we're going to be looking at semen uh, 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 that originates in the kidney. We're going to be looking at some of the problems with mathematics as far as inheritance. Uh, we'll be looking at the sun that sets in the pool. Uh, we'll be looking at the cow's milk, which comes from the excrement and blood. Uh, we'll be lo- one of the one that brought, was brought up in the debate that we did a few weeks ago. We'll be looking at where the honey comes from, whether it comes from the abdomen abdomen of the bee, or if it actually comes from the honeycomb. We'll be looking at whether or not all flying things and, and animals create communities as humans. We'll look at the sun and the moon, whether one chases the other. And then we're going to look at also the seven heavens and the seven earths, what they're to do, what they're, what that's all about. And we'll be looking at the meteorites, whether or not they chase jinns. We'll be looking also at the story of Solomon and his ability to talk to birds and ants, especially looking at ants. That's right. And we'll actually end with the embryological cycle. Mm-hmm. So these are the ones that we're going to be doing in the next episodes. I can't say how many episodes we're doing Absolutely. because we might we unpack them. Absolutely. We want to take our quickly. time because we want the audience to enjoy, you know, this analysis. But hopefully this was a teaser for for you to know that we're serious about taking these arguments at face value and we want to assess them and we want to provide a uh, uh, basically a debunk if you wish or a refutation for these kind of claims because if we don't do it uh, then we're gonna let our Muslim friends basically run with it assuming that it's true so we're doing it really out of love for them because we want them to understand that you cannot use these claims and here's why Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. Also, hit the bell so that you don't miss future videos. And please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com.
forward slash Sira International. And together, we can introduce Muslims to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you.